Hey, welcome or welcome back to my channel. T today I want to talk about my favorite murder. So, I shouldn't have said that in the first 30 seconds. I may have to cut that out. Oh well. But I, I got this idea from the Do We Know Them podcast. And if you love this episode of I Love Brutal Death, it's my favorite. Please join our Patreon. I know if Amanda was alive, she'd be a Patreon member. Thank God for true crime. What would I do if people weren't getting brutally murdered? This is the best job. If we're in the top three comedy podcasts. We'd be Conan this week. Guess you could say we're killing it. Murdering the game. OMG, I'm dead. You're dead. Amanda's dead. I know the police report said she died from kidney failure and her boyfriend was across the country, but I still feel like her boyfriend did it. We'll leave his contact information in the description of this episode. Please, brutal deathers, harass him and help us solve this case. The police won't give us access to the autopsy but as soon as she's in the ground we'll dig it up shout out to our sponsor lululemon no hotter way to get killed than in one of their new workout sets remember brutal deathers stay hot and don't get shot slay but don't get slay they basically showed a tiktok that was kind of ha ha parodying my favorite murder so if you don't know my favorite murder is a really popular true crime podcast but it has recently come under fire, which I don't know why only recently, but anyway, it's recently come under fire for being insensitive and a ton of other issues. So I found this article on a website called, one second, I'm pulling it up, called In The Know. And I'll, I'll link this source down below because number one that that's a good thing to do and number two I cannot read all of it because of copyright reasons YouTube does not allow you to read an entire article in your video because copyright but anyway this article is titled former my favorite murder fans recount past controversies and question ethics of top charting true crime podcast and series of TikToks. And it is written by somebody named Katie Mather. And I'm not going to read all this, but one of the one of the sub headings says who are the hosts of my favorite murder the hosts have more comedy focused backgrounds he'll 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 get Harif was a writer and stand-up comedian for a number of years and hard stark was a host on the cooking channel and a contributor to drunk history so their po podcast itself is advertised as true crime comedy unlike other true crime unlike other popular true crime podcasts such as Rhyme Junkies, Horde and Scale, and Anatomy of Murder, MFM is supposed to seem like eavesdropping on two friends' conversation at a party, according to the Washington Post. The hosts, the hosts make jokes, share personal stories, and go on on and go off on, sorry, I'm really bad at reading out loud, go off on conversational tangents throughout each episode. And their facts as Andrea Den Hoyd described it in the New Republic in 2019, their facts are from shows and various not strictly uh, authoritative online sources. They're loose with details and riff free really. So I'm gonna skip around a bit because again I can't 
read the whole thing. So now they're going a bit into the people talking about this on TikTok. It tried to be like a conflict-free space, you know, I, it was like, oh, we don't talk about politics, we just talk about murder. And Karen and Georgia, who were the hosts of the show, were like, they made a really big show about how, like, if somebody corrected them on something, they were growing, learning, changing, and they would be really willing to hear it out and change their behavior. For example, uh, they used to say prostitutes in the early episodes and then somebody corrected them as oh we don't say prostitutes anymore we say sex worker and they were like thank you so much another thing they used to do is just throw around mental health diagnoses um just willy-nilly you know oh this person's a psychopath this person's a sociopath this person has schizophrenia and like people from the mental health community were like hey this is dangerous you shouldn't do that and they were like oh my god thank you so much so you would expect if there was something that was racist or a microaggression that was in that space, that our two woke white women would gladly jump on it. No, 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 that's not the case. She posts this. Definitely pause to read because there's a lot of information here, but she sort of apologizes for her moment on Instagram. And there at the bottom, you can see that Georgia and Karen donated $10,000 to an indigenous charity which is a good thing, right? It is. It's a good thing. And I'm not going to step on that good thing that they did. That's not the problem. The problem is that it took two months to get to that good thing, right? Two months of ignoring and then silencing and then doubling down and arguing and gaslighting. And then they get to that. In 2019 called Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered, which is like the main tagline of the podcast. Again, while I initially didn't really see anything wrong with it, I definitely now looking back on it see how it's pretty victim blamey, especially considering that sometimes they overly praise survivors who were able to fight off their attacker and not those who didn't have the opportunity. Another Instagram she posted and big fucking trigger warning for this one especially if you're a CSA victim. At a live show, Georgia was gifted these anatomically correct dolls that are used when talking to CSA victims. She took pictures with them and posted about how, and I quote, gleeful she was about it. Why she ever thought it would be okay to say these things is beyond me. So this was obviously very triggering to a lot of survivors and they commented to tell her like, hey, people still use this and even if they didn't, this is still fucked up. Then she just blocked the survivors that were calling her out. She also apologized and donated more money, but obviously the damage to many survivors was already done. So I will find these TikToks and also include them in this video. But Jen, Jen Jackson, a TikTok user who described Hive herself as a ground floor fan of MFM of MFM <clears throat> said that initially she liked that the ho hosts would consider commenter corrections about mental health and sex work. Jackson also liked the catch phrases from the show that was printed on the show's merch, which is its own controversy, the whole, um, stay sexy and don't get murdered. That's not really a great catchphrase because it's kind of victim blamey and also it's just making light of a topic that affects a lot of people and is tragic. But Jackson started to have a problem with the show when they released a t-shirt in the summer of 2017 with an abbreviation of the show's sign off, stay sexy and don't get murdered alongside the image of a TEP. Let's just remember that this was a podcast about true crime and murder and the imagery that was being shown was indigenous imagery, Jackson said. All over social media, people were basically saying, hey, this is really insensitive for you to use indigenous imagery when we he have this information about murdered and hissing indigenous women, which is a big issue in 
in America and in Canada and other countries is that many indigenous women are murdered and go missing and they do not receive the same press that other people that go missing and are murdered do. Jackson specifically referenced a 2019 study that found homicide was the third leading cause of death for, for indigenous women in 2017, the same year and the MFM shirt came out. The conversation surrounding the merchandise, according to Jackson, was split between pointing out how insensitive the imagery he was and others defending the imagery because MFM is a murder podcast, which I really don't understand what the idea of a murder podcast is supposed to be. As somebody who's been a fan since the very beginning, who have absolutely no idea how often people are like, how could you be offended by this? It's a murder podcast, she said, which, like, in some ways I do kind of agree. And let me be clear here, I'm not justifying this at all, but... I personally think the whole premise behind the show is offensive. The entire show is offensive. So everything they're going to put out is going to be offensive. And that's why I don't support it. And I know we all like different things and find different things offensive. But I think objectively, a podcast titled My Favorite Murder, where there's casual banter about murder and other horrific things, is kind of tasteless. Jackson added that other so-called microaggressions were ha happening in various MFM-branded Facebook groups, which Jackson said she knew and Hill and Gareth and Hard Stark looked at because they referenced the groups on podcast episodes. And they finally addressed it on the show. It's incredibly underwhelming, Jackson said about the TP shirt backlash and Facebook group infighting. Jackson hair phrased what she remembers the podcast response being like uh, alleging that Hilgarth said something along the lines of we do not condone racism. Jackson added that she remembered Hard Stark saying that they would get rid of the TP merch because of the backlash, but they did not. What? You're saying you're going to get rid of the merch and then you don't? It stays up for a very, very long time, Jackson said, referring to the, to the months following, and it was still available for sale. Um, not going to read that part because, again, copyright, but... I'll get to the next section of the article, which is entitled, My Favorite Murder Host Accused of Inappropriate Social Media Hosts. Lara Whitley, who describes herself in her TikTok bio as a reformed true crime podcaster, told her following that She'd been working on a deep dive about MFM for a couple of months. Whitley, like Jackson, sorry, I thought a bug was biting me, <laughs> was an early fan of the podcast and also a member of the Facebook group. Whitley said the group was initially a really positive and supportive in environment. I, I get it. I loved to talk about really fucked up 
if that happened to me too, at least I had, but the older I get and the more perspective I gain, everything that this sort of genre has become is really icky and gross. We Italy covered another incident with Hart Stark and Instagram. In 2019, Hart Stark had been gifted dolls she thought had been vintage and used during the satanic panic by a fan who identified as a forensic interviewer. Do forensic interviewers really watch who listen to this garbage? If they do, that really frightens me. But yeah. The dolls are to this day used by victims of child SA. A Redditor in the MFM group screenshotted the post before Hardstruck took it down and included her caption. She took pictures with them and posted about how, and I quote, lethal she was about it. Whitley said, why she, he ever thought it would be okay to say these things is beyond me. I'm a sick, sick person, Hardstruck had written. I almost started Crying with glee. I love old awful things. What the hell? She is excited to have possession of a doll that is used for victims of child SA. That, that is beyond being a sick, sick person. Hardstruck apologized for the post and in response donated to the Joyful Heart Foundation, a charity dedicated to educating and advocating against child abuse. And now they get into a bit of the controversy around Billy Henson. But we at least said there is one issue that she believes is leading to the podcast decline. The controversy surrounding Billy Jensen, an investigative journalist and the former host of the podcast The Murder Squad. So if you're into true crime at all, you probably know who Billy Jensen is. But I was today years old when I found out that he was accused of sexual harassment and misconduct. But then again, I've kind of been trying to dip out of the true crime space. Like, I still watch Kendall Ray and Daniel Howlin, and I listen to podcasts like Something Was Wrong, and I also really like Sarah Turney's podcast. But I'm, I am trying to really be conscious of the type of content I consume. Henson was accused by a number of women of sexual harassment and assault. And the podcast subsequently ended. The murder squad was under the Exactly Right Network, which was founded by Hill, Hill, Hill Gareth and Hard Stark. And an employee from the network was one of the uh, accusers. The uh, employee immediately reported this incident to their supervisors, and they really did nothing and just continued to make her work with him, Hitley said. Now they're clearly not responsible for his actions. <laughs> However, they are responsible for their inability to take action in a situation like that. So I'm not really going to go into all of the Billy Jensen accusations because you can look that up. I will link some sources down below that go into it. But then this article talks about why people enjoy true crime in the first place 
and at this point I would like to kind of move away from this article but I'll also say that another YouTuber Hada on Demand has a really great video on true crime where she talks about why people are into it but also why it's harmful especially true crime podcasts and content that make light of it so after you're done watching this video i would encourage you to go watch that if you have not already not that not that uh, 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 hada needs my promotion because her channel is a lot bigger than mine but just in case you know who I am and you don't know who she is, then go watch that if you are interested in it. Now I want to talk about Stephanie Harlow. This is a Reddit post posted in r slash beauty guru hatter and you can't see who was the poster because it's been their account has been deleted i don't really know how that works don't ask me i i'm a very beginner reddit user i've been a very beginner reddit user for like two years now but we don't have to talk about that but it is titled some bots on stephanie harlow and true crime beauty the, this post is not to shame or judge you for enjoying crime. Being curious in the darker aspects of humanity is natural. I understand this, but potentially give further context of what it, it is like to have someone who who has known the victim of these crimes come up in your YouTube recommended. Before, before I entered my 20s, two of my friends were murdered. In both cases, I knew both of the murderers. I think, I think it's really why I have no interest in true crime, but while I understand that women and those in the LGBTQ community in particular are drawn to this subject. The, these are most often the victims of these crimes, but in films, books, TV, bad mothers, and those in the LGBTQ community are painted as responsible for these crimes. The, the hardest part uh, about this content is that the victims of these murders you will never know them you will not know my sweet 16 year old friend who took beautiful photographs and had artistic talent way beyond her, her years you will not hear her laugh or her be able to cringe at things you've done when you've had a, a rush together. The both of the both of you will not double over in laughter, talking about getting on an antidepressant and feeling a lot better but having no sex drive. This is this was taken away from me, my friends, our community and the world. In my local newspaper after my friend was murdered an article written an article written about her and said I did her humbler and made fun of her love of the Smith hits and the fact that she had reblogged a gif of Charles Hansen. You will not know my college roommate. You have not been to our freshman dorm. You don't know how beautiful her green eyes were or how captivating my friend could be. You didn't watch her flirt with his guys to get, to get free alcohol and leave a party so we could go home and drink and watch Netflix. You 
have not taken shots of a fireball while watching Parks and Rec with her while we gossip about cute boys he, who don't know about how much she he struggled with telling people who oh know when and they said they needed her, her help he, who don't hear you can't hear her thick a a accent or watch her bounce down on the halls of your dorm and scream her name but you might know about her murder and the gruesome way she was taken from this world Stephanie Harlow recently made a video about my friend and while I do not think her intentions are malicious it was on my YouTube recommended, even though I have never seen a Stephanie Harlow video. I have a very close friend who really enjoys her content, and she relayed some of the information about my friend's most tragic moment to me. It is the little things about how they characterize a person that that make you angry when people recount these stories. No, she, he wasn't just like that. She was different. The media can get a lot wrong, and true crime podcasters and YouTubers are usually not journalists, and they are compiling information from many different places. So, um, whose accuracy may be biased or patently false, for example, my friend who was murdered and who was made fun of for having a Tumblr in 2013 and being a teenage. So, uh, obviously I can't verify if this Reddit poster is genuine and this genuinely happened, but I would like to take it at face value because I would hope most People would not lie about that sort of thing. But I'm just adding that it can't be verified so that people know I'm not stating this as fact. But I'm I'm personally going to believe it. But you can believe what you want. But either way, I do believe this indicates that there is an issue in the true crime community and how many people don't respect the wishes of family members and friends and Stephanie Harlow in particular. I, I've i called her out for this before and got shit on by a lot of her fans, but I don't care. She editorializes a lot and what I mean by that is she adds a lot of things to her content that aren't necessarily fact and she'll come up with stories about these people. Like I imagine her painting on a Friday night and her lover comes into a room. Like if you want to be a fiction writer, Stephanie, do that. But maybe true crime is not for you then because when you're not just relaying the facts and being focused on who the person actually was instead of your romanticized idea of them, then you're really doing more harm than good. And I know people say things like, oh, there are many worse true, true crime YouTubers out there like Stephanie Sue and Bailey Sarian and a lot of other people. And yeah, you, you can always make that art argument. And I'm not trying to cancel Stephanie. I would much rather her take a step back and reflect and be a bit more sensitive to these people. Because even if she thinks she's doing a nice thing by setting this scene and making up this story, it can still cause harm and spread misinformation because you really don't know what happened in a private conversation or what somebody did.
no amount of research can really tell you that unless you actually knew the person. So those are my thoughts on this topic. And obviously there's a lot more to talk about, but yeah, I'm going away for a week. So I'm trying to do some free recording because I won't have what hi-fi or a any of that. So yeah, but thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. And if you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you have not already, and you would like to see more of my content, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope to see you again next time. Bye.